have uh, Mona Castle, uh, who is a, a Wiener Canada Research Scholar and a third year PhD candidate working with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Giacomi. Uh, she also got her master's degree from the same group in the chemical engineering department at Queen's University of Canada. So Mana Carter's research is currently highlighted in the reality of the coronavirus particles. You know, the pandemic has persisted for two years and it's way more enough than we can uh, like stand it. So, but we still don't know little about how this, uh, like the reality of these virus particles. And today, uh, Mana Casa will give a talk on the uh, coronavirus rotationary diffusivity and reality. So let's uh, give the uh, platform to Mana Casa. Okay, thank you, Kai. Thank you for this introduction. And thank you for inviting me today to present in this seminar. It's a pleasure to present to, present to this audience. Um, so today I'll be, as Kai said, uh, our lives were disrupted by this coronavirus and um, Luckily, we found a way to study coronavirus from a rheology perspective. So I definitely get into that in this uh, presentation. But before that, um, today I'm presenting to you from Queen's University, uh, which is uh, located uh, in Kingston, Ontario. And if, uh, if you wanna know where Kingston is located, uh, it's actually located at around Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario is a huge lake. I believe it's the uh, biggest, uh, the 13th biggest uh, lake in the world. Um, and for reference, Toronto is right here and Kingston is located Eastern Ontario right here. And this is a zoom in to Kingston. We have a beautiful campus and it's just at the lake. Like the lake is the highlight of Kingston. Uh, this is just um, a shot of the uh, Queen's campus all around. And throughout this presentation, you'll see a couple of pictures I took through my lens of Queen's and Kingston. And so before I get into uh, coronavirus, I will teach you a bit about orientation. I teach you about general rigid hydro theory, which is a macromolecular theory used to study and model different polymers. So first of all, I'm going to start with orientation. The reason I want to start with orientation is because in macromolecular theory, we believe that orientation controls everything. So, you know, all polymers, they produce different characteristics. They produce uh, viscosity, elasticity. Uh, they flow in a certain way. And this flow, flow is determined by the orientation of these polymers, so for example. For a very simple model, uh, which is which we call the rigid uh, dumbbell model, um, this model is basically modeled by two spheres. As you see here, each sphere has a fixed mass m and a fixed diameter b, and they are located at a specific length away from each other. It's length l. And keep in mind that this rod right here is actually an imaginary rod. It's massless. Uh, the mass is only contained in the, those two spheres right here. So this is the simplest model we could look at in macromolecular theory. And to understand orientation or study orientation, we'll have to look at the diffusion equation. So this diffusion equation describes how the polymers orient. Orientation is described by the F term spread throughout this equation. And for the people that are unfamiliar with diffusion equation, it's important to learn that in this diffusion equation, you have the three main terms. On the left side, you have the time dependent term, which is basically the accumulation of momentum of, the, of those polymer suspensions. On the right side, the first term is the Brownian motion term. You might have heard this before that polymers move or are controlled or influenced actually by their, their thermal motion or their Brownian motion. And that's the first term on the right side right here. Now, the second term on the right side is the convective term. 
because we have gamma dot, which is the shear rate. Um, so it's at this point, just keep in mind, we have those three terms and three, sorry, these three uh, uh, parameters that describe the diffusion equation. Now, looking back at the simple model, uh, you see here that we uh, kind of uh, position the coordinate system in the center of this rod, and we are able to look at the diffusion equation, or it's actually written in terms of the spherical coordinates. You see them right here, the theta and the gamma. And so back to this simple model right here, I'm able to detect the orientation using the spherical coordinates, theta and gamma angles. Now, for more complex uh, polymers, we're not really able to detect the orientation just from the F term that I just explained earlier, and not only from the spherical coordinates. I'll have to look at it from a, a, from a different angle or a different way. To do that, uh, first of all, I can look at the orientation using the psi. Now the psi is equal to the f, the orientation distribution that I just presented earlier, divided by the sine theta. And the psi describes the orientation of this complex polymer. And it's now called the conf configuration space distribution function. Second thing, the diffusion equation I just presented earlier is now explained in terms of the Euler angles in, uh, given by this equation right here. I'll go, in, uh, I'll go into the order angles in a sec, but just notice the size that are in the, this equation. Now, if you look at this equation very closely, the time dependent is not, uh, the time dependent term is not there and the convective terms are not there either. And I'll explain why in a second. Uh, but before that, Let's look at the Euler angles. Now, this is a snap from Dynamics, Dynamic uh, Polymer Liquids book by Dr. Bird, uh, Volume 2, Edition 2. Um, this is a picture that describes how we shift from Cartesian coordinates to Euler angles. And the way to do that is look at the simplest Cartesian coordinate right here, which is x, y, and z. If we shift the whole coordinate system by three angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, we get a new system, which is caret z, caret y, and caret x. And this is the new system that describes the orientation distribution of the macromolecular, uh, the, the macromolecules. So you see here, this diffusion equation or the orientation distribution function equation is in terms of those Euler angles, alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, I did tell you that the time dependent term and the convective terms are not here. So all we know is that this equation uh, is just describes the Brownian motion of the polymer. And my professor always tells me that this is one of the miracles in macromolecular theory that we're able to study the orientation of these polymers just from its thermal motion, or in other words, its architecture. And I'll tell you why in a couple of slides. Now, if you wonder where did the T go, keep in mind that the psi right here is actually given by this equation, uh, these matrices and the real part of uh, the first harmonic times the time. So just keep in mind that this time is actually contained inside the psi. Now, if you would like to learn more about orientation distribution and how the math goes on there, I refer you to uh, chapter 16 and example 16.7-1 to learn more uh, about that uh, in Dynamics uh, of Polymer Liquids, Volume 2, Edition 2. In addition to that, for all the students in the audience, if you're interested to learn more about orientation distribution and general rigid B dot theory, uh, Professor Jackman and I just wrote a chapter. Uh, it's a part of a collaboration that's happening in North America. It's a book that's going to be produced hopefully next year, and it contains all um, the steps and the details 
that go into this theory. So if you're ever interested, please let me know. I'm happy to share this PDF with you. Uh, and I just like to say here that this book is created by engineers and for engineers. This is one of Queen's uh, beautiful pictures. So now going on into general widget builder theory, I'd like to say this is my expertise. Uh, so as I said earlier, polymers are very complex. They uh, uh, carry a lot of complex viscoelastic properties. And one way to look at them and study them is to use general rigid b dot theory. Now, this theory was first developed by Professor Hasiger back in the 70s. And he developed it for specific structures. So this is where my work, uh, where, this is where I came into play. I studied it, I redeveloped it, and I applied it for different architectures. Um, now, when I, I first digged into this theory, the first thing I realized is that, okay, I have to understand what axisymmetric and asymmetric macromolecules mean. And one way to understand that is to look at these macromolecules from an ellipsoidal lens because every single macromolecule out there can be described or uh, designed as an, as an ellipsoid. Some um, macromolecules have a prolate ellipsoid, some of them have an oblate ellipsoid, and some of them just have none because prolate and oblate ellipsoids are axisymmetric. And when the minor axes are unequal, we call it an asymmetric ellipsoid. And just general info, when I say axisymmetric, I mean that the first and the second moments of inertia are equal. And when it's asymmetric, those moments of inertia are not equal. Another way to look at axisymmetric and asymmetric macromolecules is to actually look at, at it from a macromolecular lens. So for example, right here, I modeled two, I modeled two polymers. First polymer is the, the red polymer, is a backbone branch polymer with four branch branches around the long chain. Whereas the other macromolecule, it's a long cha chain branch with two branches along the chain. The difference here is that the red polymer has equal moments of inertia. I want to use equal to I2. And the second one, um, are, uh, in the second one, the moments of inertia are unequal. This is how I classify it. I know now, okay, the red one is axisymmetric, the blue one is asymmetric. Now, now we have the knowledge about what axisymmetric and asymmetric models mean. Second step into this theory is to actually model the polymers. So if you come up to me telling me, okay, I have this collection of polymer chains. How am I going to position my beads? I would tell you that each collection of polymer chains is going to be modeled by one sphere, or I call it one bead. This bead has a mass, has a fixed mass M and a fixed diameter D. So, for example, I could model. Uh, big chain of uh, collection, a big chain of polymer chains by a backbone branch polymer. Now, after I had it modeled, I position all my beads. I know where they are. I have to position my coordinate system. And to do that, I have to determine where the axis of symmetry is for this polymer. So for example, for a backbone branch polymer, the axis of symmetry is along the long chain and the two uh, uh, and the two other, sorry, where delta three is positioned and the two other coordinate systems or the two other coordinates are along the branches. Notice that I also position every bead uh, away from the other with a, fixed, uh, with a fixed distance, I call it L, and L is the center to center distance between nearest bead centers. So all of those beads you see right here are positioned at equal distances away from each other. Now for ringed polymers, the axis of symmetry actually goes through the ring. 
right here. And again, uh, the distance L is between the nearest bead centers. Lastly, for star branched polymers, the axis of symmetry again goes through the star and the, uh, the length L is between the nearest bead centers. Another beautiful picture of Queens. Now I'm gonna uh, go into the method or the mathematical method I use to compute all the properties I study in general bridget Bureau theory. So after I model my polymer, I have all my spheres and my beads on the drawing, I'm able to calculate the center of mass. And from that, I'm able to calculate the positions of every single bead, Ri1, Ri2, and Ri3. Having these coordinates, will allow me to calculate the moments of inertia, I1, I2, and I3. Now, this is when I recheck my work. I recheck, is I1 equal to I2? Then it's axisymmetric, I go on. If it's not equal, if, if I1 is not equal to I2, it's an asymmetric macromolecule and it's out of my work scope. In this uh, work, I just focus on axisymmetric macromolecules. So with I1 and I2 and I3, I'm able to detect or compute three important parameters, A, B, and nu. Now, I'd like to call them architectural constants. And these are very special um, and they're, they're, very, uh, they're actually very, um, they're actually very, uh, sorry, I lost the word. Uh, they're designed for macromolecular theory. So you won't be able to detect those three parameters in any, in any other theory. So all we know right now is that B is proportional to, to elasticity. But at this point, I don't really know the influence of A on its own or new on its own on the viscoelastic properties of my polymers. So combining these three parameters together, I get a term called lopsidedness. Now, lopsidedness means the extent to which the macromolecule deviates from its spherically symmetrical structure. A spherically symmetrical structure is, can be seen as one of those polyhedra right here, and they have a lopsidedness of zero. However, if I have, for example, a rigid dumbbell or a long chain, I'm gonna have the maximum lopsidedness, which is a three over two. And I also, uh, I also plotted a very important uh, figure in my paper that is basically A nu over B. So if you ever model any polymer and you're wondering, is it oblate or prolate, your model should fall on one of these branches, either at the extremities or within the branch itself. Now, in one of my papers in the past, I studied 24 different uh, polymers different ones. So I have, for example, right here, ring chains. I have long chains. I call them shish kebabs. Shish kebabs are, it's like a universal term for long chain polymers. Right here, I have polyhedras. And all along this prolate branch, you have I have the backbone branch polymers. So it's just a fun way to um, distinguish uh, if the polymer is prolate or oblate. Notice that I have none on the oblate branch, but uh, after this paper, we actually studied uh, different macromolecules, for example, DNA, and DNA does fall on this oblate branch, I guess somewhere right here. So after I've explained to you the major architectural parameters that we look at, uh, I'm gonna just show you some basic uh, rheolo rheology, rheological uh, properties that I look into or I compute in my work. So one of them is relaxation time. You know, in rheology, it's very important for us to understand at which point does the polymer relax, especially after positioning it or putting it under shear stress. And it's described by this equation right here. Notice that 
it's in terms of one of the architectural constants I just uh, uh, presented to you earlier. And uh, at the same time, the lambda naught is the relaxation time of the simple model, which is the rigid uh, model. Now, the reason I give you these two equations is because in my work, I uh, like to, we like to stick to dimensionless parameters. So I get this equation. This is the dimensionless relaxation time of a polymer. Notice the simplicity and the beauty, I would say, of it. It's 12 over nu. It's in terms of one of the uh, architectural constants nu. Now, keep in mind that this work is applied or studied under oscillatory shear, which means that I'm putting these polymer suspensions between two plates in the rheometer. The lower plate is fixed. The upper plate is moving, moving back and forth. And it's exerting shear and force over these polymers. And once you do that, this is when the polymers release or produce their viscoelastic properties or responses. And those polymer suspensions or this oscillatory shear movement is only uh, applied in the small amplitude range. So I'm only uh, studying the small amplitude oscillatory shear region, which is when the shear rate is basically small. It's uh, less than one. This is the Weiserbring number, which is lambda times the shear rate amplitude. Also looking at the big picture, this is the equation for the shear stress of the polymers. Notice here we have uh, two complex viscosity terms, eta prime and eta double prime. Now for the people that are unfamiliar with these two terms, I'm sure you're familiar with viscosity with just eta. And eta is the viscosity of Newtonian fluids. Now for most polymers out there, those polymers are non-Newtonian. And them being non-Newtonian means they have more, more of a complex viscosity. And this complex viscosity cannot only be described by eta, it's described by two terms, eta prime and eta double prime. Eta prime is the real part. Eta double prime is the minus the imaginary part. And those two terms uh, were developed in the following uh, shape. I was actually able to develop these equations also using Hassiger's chapter. So these are the two equations for the two complex viscosity terms. The first equation is the dimensionless eta prime. And the second equation is the dimensionless eta prime, double prime equation. The first equation describes the viscosity of the polymer. The second equation describes the elasticity of the polymer. And later on in my work, you'll see that I plotted both for different architectures and different shapes. And of course, combining them both gives the complex viscosity eta star. One of the beautiful sunsets uh, on the lake in Kingston. And this is when COVID hit. So I've been studying all this work even before I started my PhD. I did that uh, during my master's and the first year of my, uh, my PhD. Now, when COVID hit, my professor and I uh, were interested in this, um, in this uh, virus because looking at its, its, at its architecture, we did find that it's, it's special. So we did, we did come up with a way to model this polymer and study its rotational diffusivity. I'll explain to you later on what rotational diffusivity means. Now, in this paper, I studied four different, sorry, four different viruses, tobacco mosaic and Gemini viruses, which are plant viruses, the adenovirus, which is a common cold or like flu-like virus, and the coronavirus, which is pretty well known. Uh, the reason I study for viruses is that there were no data, there was no data available on the corona back then. And even till this day, there is no biological data available on corona. And for me to be able to validate my model, I studied the three different viruses that have um, experimental data available. 
and thus I was able to say, okay, this model works on viruses and thus it can work or it does work on coronavirus. In this paper, I introduce uh, the term called rotational diffusivity. Now, uh, viruses are not modal. So for them to be able to move in blood streams, they, are, they rely on their thermal motion. And this thermal motion is dependent on the rotational diffusivity. And this is how it's able to align with its papillomer targets. So rotational diffusivity it is what allows it to move, position itself, and align with the targets, and basically infect. And this rotational diffusivity, um, again, I compute it in non-dimensional um, parameters. And I make it non-dimensional with respect to the simplest relaxation time. Notice that it's, again, a very simple, beautiful equation. And it's, it's in terms of one my, uh, it's in terms of one of my architectural constants, new. So starting off with the first virus, tobacco mosaic. Now, tobacco mosaic is a long chain made up of 12 beads. Uh, I would say it's a shish kebab. Again, it's a universal term used for long chains. And uh, we were able to study or compute different parameters. So for tobacco mosaic, I computed the moments of inertia, I1, I2, I3. I checked, it's an, of course, and it's an axisymmetric macromolecule. I was able to uh, compute the architectural constants A, B, and nu, along with many other parameters. For example, the Jewish shear steady rate, relaxation time, and the rotational diffusivity, which I'm most interested in. Again, I said earlier that I was validating my models with experiment. So I compared my complex viscosity uh, results of tobacco mosaic with the experimental data of tobacco mosaic out there. And looking at this figure, now the black smooth curves and the dashed curves are my theory, and the dots all around are the experiments at different temperatures. I was able to see that my theory agrees with experiment. Moving on to the Gemini virus. Now, Gemini under the microscope can be seen as two osculated beads or two osculated uh, spheres um, on top of each other. But in the detail microscope, we see that no, they're not actually only two spheres. There's more detail uh, that's under uh, that's in those two beads positioned uh, above each other. So we modeled it in two different ways. I modeled it in a simple way with the oscillated beads, and I modeled it with twin truncated icosahedra. Each one of those is actually an icosahedra. Each one of them is made up of 11 beads, and they're positioned on top of each other. Again, for these two models, I computed the same parameters I computed for tobacco mosaic, and I plotted them uh, in a complex viscosity figure. Now, what do we notice here? We notice that for eta prime, which describes the viscosity of the polymer, having a finer structure raises the viscosity, green goes with Gemini, and for the elasticity of the polymer, having a finer structure lowers the elasticity. So th this is when I deduce that the detailed structure of polymers do make a difference. At least to this point, they make a difference for Gemini viruses. For the adenovirus, as I said earlier, it's the common cold or the flu-like virus. I modeled it as an icosahedra. It has 12 spikes all around, and it's made up of 252 beads. Again, I computed all the uh, parameters I've seen earlier, I've computed earlier for the other viruses. And for this virus, actually, um, I, the, one of the challenges were to know where to position the spike. You see those green spheres all around. These are the spikes or the vertices of the adenovirus. So with literature search, I was able to come up with this ratio. I knew that, okay, 
this spike is positioned away from the capsid by this distance. So this is how I position those spikes all around. And for the adenovirus, I actually found in literature the translation, uh, translational diffusivity and the tra translational diffusivity is proportional to the, sorry, it's inversely proportional to the rotational diffusivity. And using that data, I was able to actually compute the relaxation time of the adenovirus at body temperature. It's, and it's in orders of 10 to the power minus six. And I think it's just cool to have this data out there. So now I'm gonna move into the coronavirus model. Now you see in this video right here, uh, this is a spike. So I'm gonna start from the beginning actually. So what you see right here is the actual spike on the COVID particle or the COVID, COVID capsid. You see that first of all, sorry, you see first of all that it has a triangular shape and it's hollow, notice that. And now if you look at it from the other side, you see that it's long as it's wide. So it's it, the length is basically equal to the width. And this is when I decided, okay, I can model these spikes by spheres because the length is basically equal to the width. So looking at it from, uh, this is the study picture. This is where I decided, okay, I'm gonna make the whole spike look like a sphere. And this is the uh, general model we came up with. The red spheres all around are the spikes, or in other words, they're the peplimers of the coronavirus. And the gray spheres you see are the actual capsid. Now keep in mind that I explained earlier in general jet period theory, all the whole polymer should be modeled by the same mass uh, sphere with a fixed mass M and a fixed diameter D. That's why I use the same mass I use for the spikes to model the capsid itself. And at, uh, here, it's very important to note that these spikes are charged repellent. Everything you see here is actually charged. So now at this point, uh, oh, and one more thing to mention is that I modeled it with 74 spikes because literature out there did think or say that the COVID particle does have 74 spikes. This is why I use this number. Now at this point, I know that this is how I wanna model it. I'm gonna use spheres all around. And I know that they are, these spikes are charged. But the, the, I guess the most challenging part in this problem is that I didn't know where to locate these uh, spikes. Like, how did I know how to get this here and this here and this here? I needed coordinates. And because these spikes are charged, this problem is a Thompson problem. Now, for the people not familiar with the Thompson problem, uh, the, Thompson pro the solution for the Thompson problem gives you uh, coordinates for charged uh, molecules all around a sphere. And I used this paper, paper by Wales, uh, written in 2006. He actually gave a wide range of ions and charges for different numbers all around polyhedra and spheres. Uh, so for example, let me show you this. This is one of the Thompson solutions uh, he came up with for 74 charged, uh, charged points. And as you notice here, that this is just uh, basically a collection of charges. And in this polyhedra, we can actually count nine regular pentagons. And they're the red pentagons you see on uh, that sphere or that polyhedra. And the others are basically irregular hexagons. Uh, we didn't count them, but we know there are more than nine. Um, so having that in mind, again, the fourth challenge was to position the spike away from the capsid. So again, I did my literature search and I figured that the spike should be positioned at least between five over four and four over three, um, a ratio away from the capsid. And this is where I give like my different parameters. So now. I modeled my COVID. 
I have all the coordinate coordinates. Having all the coordinates means I can position my coordinate system and thus deduce the complex viscosity uh, parameters or the properties and the rotational diffusivity property, which is the main thing I was looking at in this paper. So we know that, or we discovered that uh, the COVID particle adding, actually adding more spikes to the COVID particle lowers the rotational diffusivity of coronavirus. Um, now, the thing I think you're asking yourself here, okay, does that mean it moves, it's going gonna, it's gonna to infect better or is going to infect faster if it has lower or like higher rotational diffusivity? At this point, all I can say is that it just needs to have the right amount of spikes. And based on the literature, we know that it's 74. Having 74 spikes will, uh, will make it have around, uh, it, it will have the rotational diffusivity around 10 to the power minus four. And thus, this is the right amount of thermal motion uh, that the COVID particle needs to move a line and then infect the body cells. So then I, this was just another interesting idea to look into because I modeled for different uh, viruses. I was interested in looking at those uh, four viruses, uh, looking at their compress viscosities altogether. So you notice here that I have the blue and the red uh, vertical lines. These are the uh, visc viscous properties, sorry, the viscous uh, parameters for adeno and corona. You see that they're basically flat, and that's because they're spherical. Remember earlier, I said that spherical structures have lopsidedness of zero, which means that uh, they have no elasticity kind of at all or negligible. And uh, they have, uh, they act as a Newtonian uh, fluid. For the, we actually did see some elasticity for the COVID particle, but just know that it's in terms of 10 to the power minus eight, which is pretty low. And if you're interested to look, in, uh, to look at the different uh, uh, dimensions of these viruses, I just uh, put it out there. We just made this slide like yesterday. Uh, you could see here that the length of the viruses do differ, uh, Gemini being the shortest and the adeno being the longest. And we could also look at the width of these particles, adeno also being, again, the widest uh, virus between uh, all of them, and the tobacco being the thinnest. Queens, again, just as a breather, because now uh, I'm moving on to the latest project I did earlier this year on coronavirus, because after I studied all of these viruses together, I was interested in studying the detailed structure of the COVID particle because I only modeled my spikes as one spheres. So I asked myself, how about I, what if I model this spike as an actual triangle, triangle as in having three spheres positioned around this equilateral triangle we have uh, uh, drawn around those spikes. So what I did, is that I made every single papillomer or spike that you saw earlier as a three bead. So every three or triad is basically one spike. You see them right here. This is one, two, three, one, two, three. And I plotted this particle against the single beaded particle or model I did earlier. And we did discover that having a more detailed structure for the coronavirus does lower the rotational diffusivity, and it, but it does move in the same way. So all I know now also is that having more spikes or more papillomers lowers the rotational diffusivity of the COVID particles, and having more details lowers the whole rotational diffusivity curve. And note that it it's not actually a big difference. Like this is in orders of 10 to the power minus four. Uh, also, I did see that both of those uh, models or coronavirus particles have a bit of elasticity, 
but I would say it's hardly in any elasticity because again, it's uh, 10 to the power minus eight. So at this point, I'm done presenting the uh, what I've done in the past. Um, future thing we're looking into, uh, we're currently working on looking at the pleomorphism of coronavirus, which means that I'm looking at different shapes of the COVID particle. Because uh, recent microscopies have uh, pre presented that coronavirus can not only be spherical, it can be actually ellipsoidal. So we're looking into that. We're hoping to finish that very soon. Other things we could look into is uh, actually the combination of variables equation. Like nobody has actually studied this so far. So this is the orientation uh, uh, equation that I presented, uh, that I actually discussed earlier in the presentation. You see this term right here. It's actually in terms of the architectural constants. And up to this point, nobody has actually rewritten this equation and actually understood what it is controlling the, or the orientation in this term. So hopefully we might be interested in studying this in the future or anybody of the, in the audience would be interested to study that too. And by that, I thank my, um, and now this is, I thank my research group, uh, my professor Jeffrey Jackman and all of my colleagues for their help in this project. And of course, I thank uh, Vanier scholarships for funding my PhD program and my tax for funding this um project specifically and i end this presentation by this beautiful video it's actually captured by my professor jeffrey jackman he captured it a couple of years ago in uh, uh, in wales united kingdom and it's actually a gyroscope of the order angles so that's why uh, we uh, were fascinated by this video although back then we did not work on order angles but it did have a reason to be captured. So I just wanted to end uh, the presentation with this video. And thank you all for listening. And by that, I take any questions. Yeah, thanks for this uh, impressive presentation. So if anyone has any questions, you can either raise your hand or just open your mic to ask Mona any question you like. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, if no, I have a, a very general question. Mm -hmm. So, yes. so when you say the reality, it seems like it's quite different. Like even I'm doing suspension, it's quite different from the uh, reality from the uh, fluid mechanics perspective. Mm -hmm. But but you also mentioned like like the two plates and and then you have oscillation of shear. So is this reality pertinent to the to the like like say Newtonian fluid, non-Newtonian fluid, like we really quite familiar with? Uh, sorry, did you, is, uh, the, the last part was, like, is it, how I is mean, it Newtonian on Newtonian? Yes, yes. I mean, like, is this reality still, like, similar to, like, we change the viscosity, we change, like, the mm -hmm. constitu uh, constitutive relation there? Mm -hmm. Definitely, because um, if we look at the basic equations for complex viscosity, I'm going to go back to them. Um, yeah, right here. So, um, for, for example, I did mention earlier that uh, some polymers are Newtonian, and we, we do not see these two equations in Newtonian. In Newtonian, we, also, we only see the eta, which is in terms of the, uh, which is a partial differential equation with respect to the uh, uh, distance or position. Uh, the thing is that if you go to non Newtonian fluids, you will see eta per eta double prime. You will see this equation. Now, in my work, I haven't studied. I, I mean, I did study some Newtonian fluids because, I mean, how do I know that? Because if I look at the, uh, the complex viscosity figures, the Newtonian fluids usually give a uh, linear uh, viscous response. They give a linear eta prime. So, but I'm honestly, like personally, I'm more interested in more complex um, polymers that give both uh, both parameters, eta prime, eta double prime, but they're both definitely included. They're under the umbrella of rheology, Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. Yeah, so hopefully thanks, that was answered. Mona. Yeah. So uh, Amanda has a has a question. So uh, could you read this on your screen, or I can read this 
uh, for your MONA? Yeah, um, so are the number of spikes relative to the severity of infection, as in the more spikes, more, uh, the more aggressive the virus gets? Not sure if this is a venue you have explored, great size, thank you. Um, okay, so I wanna go back to my rotational diffusivity uh, slide. Here, right here. Actually, I'm gonna explore this one right here. Here. So um, a good question. Um, at this point, it's not about having more spikes or less spikes. So we know that if you have very low number of spikes, we the rotational diffusivity would be basically very high and there won't be enough time for the for the COVID particle to align with the targets. Because you have to keep in mind that there's a chemical kinetics that's going on for this alignment. This alignment is basically two trimers aligning with a dimer. So it being very fast won't allow it to align properly. It would just be too fast. And it being too low, which means that I have a lot of spikes, means that uh, it's going to be very, very slow, so it won't even get to align or position itself with those uh, targets. So all we know is that it should only be at the right number of spikes. We think it's 74, it might be 90, it might be 80, but we know it's within that range. But all we know is that it shouldn't be too high and it should be too low. Just at the right number of spikes for it to align and thus infect. Yeah, thanks, Mona. So actually, uh, like you uh, investigate the uh, uh, reality, like diffusivity of the uh, coronavirus, uh, is there any like experimental data to support your theory or like something, uh, something like you can validate like your model? Right. At this point, we don't have any data available for SARS-CoV-2 particles. Uh, that's what. That's the reason I actually did. Uh, uh, that, that's why I modeled the three different viruses that have experimental data available, uh, which are these uh, the three other viruses: Adeno, Gemini, and Tobacco. Um, so no, nothing is available on SARS-CoV-2. Only available for Tobacco Mosaic, Gemini, and Adeno. So I was able to validate my model through those viruses. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. So, is any other hi, if I if I might interject here, but but um, um, Mona is humbler than her advisor. So, <laughs> what she's actually working on here, we we think, is the relevant transport property for any virus. This is known in the literature. This is not just us that thinks that. For other viruses, the rotational diffusivity has been measured and. Mona reviewed the literature in her paper. There are many methods for measuring it. For the most important virus of my lifetime, it hasn't been measured. So when you think of the amount of money that the world governments have invested in this, I find it stunning that no one has taken a microreometer, put a droplet between the slides, and measured eta prime and eta double prime so that we can deduce the rotational diffusivity of the virus. And uh, that last question, by the way, is a fantastic question. Why is Mona preoccupied with Lambda Sabar? And it's because, it's because, as she explained, two adjacent spikes must align with the target on the cell, which is a dimer. You see, they, they, they can't just approach it. They have to, those two spikes have to align with it like a key has to align into the insertion of a lock. And if the, as she expertly explained, if the, if the lambda sub r is too long or too short, the time that the alignment exists for the chemical kinetics, the attachment kinetics to take place um, is not right. And we, we think, her lambda sub r of 74, since there are roughly 74 spikes on these things, is, is the relevant value. But we need eta prime and eta double prime data, 
produced by a lab that is equipped to handle a substance this dangerous. And, and I think the, the world is overdue for that. Mm -hmm. That being said, we also know that, you know, when these particles get in our body, they're misfiring. And so the number of spikes goes down with time. And, and not every coronavirus has, has misfired the same number of times. So in fact, all of those lambda sub R's on this diagram are, are relevant, uh, especially all the ones around 74. Th those, can, those can infect too, we think, just not, not as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Kai, I, I cut you off. Yeah, there. yeah. thanks for the, for the explanation. It makes it more clear, yeah. Yeah, I guess it's also very hard to, to, measure, to measure the, like, the diffusivity because as far as you need to guess a biohazard like certificate, mm -hmm. which is not easy for us, I guess. Well, actually, what we need is a microreologist who has contracted the coronavirus, a person who is actually sick with it. They can work with the virus without fear. And, and that, that's what we need. We, we need in the microreology community. If one of those people happens to get infected and they're well enough to go into their lab, then they could they could do the measurement, you see? But what are the chances of them being ready to do it, you know, with with, with the virus or you see? But but there are government labs that are that are handling this uh, uh, live virus and, and they 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 need to buy a desktop microreometer and do the experiment. The problem is they're not, they're not rheologists, yeah. Well, I would add to that, uh, maybe sir, if they were able, to, they're not able to study the uh, COVID suspensions, they could study shaped like COVID particles because at the end of the day, I'm, ex I'm exploring or studying the COVID particle from an, from an architecture uh, point of view. So if there is a virus out there that has a very similar architecture, that might be helpful too. And it, it might be more feasible because it could be uh, less hazardous and less just risky to work on in a lab. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there any other questions? If not, uh, I, I, I had a, I had a, just, just one detail, but if Mona, Oh, you're already at slide 74. Great. So you can see um, the these two particles, like the top one is a Thompson problem, but the bottom one is not. It's a bunch of rigid triangles mm -hmm. identically charged, repelling one another. And for that, we needed a collaboration with uh, Elliot Fried's group at OIST. So I, I, I didn't have time to mention that, but that, that her, her second paper on that subject is a collaboration with uh, the lab in Japan. And there's, a, there's, an, there's an expert there on, um, on these kinds of energy minimization calculations, Vikash Chaudhuri, and, and he, he did that um, energy minimization for that. So he's, he's of course a co-author on that paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks yeah. for the uh, for the explanation, uh, Doctor Jackmin. So uh, I guess this is uh, roughly the time. So uh, I will thanks for Mona again uh, for give this uh, in, uh, impressive talk here. And uh, oh, did you raise your hand? No, I Another just question? like I was like I you know, just like uh, give a clap like in terms like you know the. Oh, you, like, okay. you know. Thank you. Yes, yeah, different, simple. Yes, yeah, my mistake. Anyway, anyway, so I'll thanks Mona again. And, uh, I